Thanks, Akiva. Uh, I'm a little alarmed by the idea that I'm going to make it back to Israel for the Amin or Amin. My wife thinks I'm making it back to Israel for Shabbos. <laughs> so, uh, if I waltz in for a Rosh Hashanah, it's probably my last Rosh Hashanah, so I will uh, make sure to dive with all of the uh, attendant intensity. In any event, it's really a great honor to be here tonight. Uh, as Akiva just mentioned, I had the pleasure of being with Stan with us in Seattle a couple of nights ago and in San Diego uh, last night and tonight. And uh, I wouldn't do that if I didn't think that this organization is extraordinarily important, doing exactly what Akiva said and what Mike said before. This is really the front line of the battle that really needs to be fought. And uh, those who are doing it, all of you who support it, are doing, it seems to me, exactly what needs to be done at a very difficult hour. Uh, and you have my extraordinary gratitude and uh, commendation as well. I think uh, we all understand that this is not any old week that this is a week in which something very profound and disturbing is transpiring in the Jewish world. And what I would like to do for the first portion of the presentation this evening, for the first hour, hour and a half, is to... Uh, <laughs> uh, why is that funny? Uh, is to try to say something about what I think is really happening in New York and what I think is not happening in New York. I'm going to tell you what I think is not happening in what I think is not happening in New York is a referendum on the future of the Palestinian state. That's what everybody says is happening. But that's not what this is. And I want to try to lay out for you a relatively clear, but it seems to me uh, un undisputable position, that what's happening in New York is actually a referendum on the state of Israel. The world is going to gather in the General Assembly first, the Security Council or America will probably be if it comes to that. Uh, but then in the General Assembly, whenever it happens, this week, next week, whenever it happens, the world is going to effectively debate not the future of Palestinian state, it is going to debate the future of the state of Israel. And we need to understand that, and then we need to understand the historical analogy to that, which I will get to in a little bit, and then we'll turn to one last thing, and we'll call it an evening. Why do I say that what's about to happen in New York is actually not about the future of a Palestinian state, but the future of the Jewish state? The reason I say that is because the Palestinians themselves have told us that. They tell us that at every single possible moment, and they're not that abashed about it. The only small little problem is that the Western world simply refuses to hear it. But I'll give you three or four examples of the kinds of things they have said and done in recent weeks and months uh, that make it just completely indisputable that what is at stake here is not Palestine, as they call it, uh, but the Jewish state, the state of Israel. Example number one, Mahmoud Abbas and everyone around him refusing to call Israel the Jewish state. Now, what's the big deal, you might say? I mean, obviously, Israel's a Jewish state, a lot of Jewish people, a lot of kosher restaurants, nobody stands in line. It is clearly a Jewish state. So why do we need Mahmoud Abbas to actually tell us that it's a Jewish state? The reason it's important for Mahmoud Abbas and somebody else in his cabinet or in their administration to recognize Israel publicly as a Jewish state is because as long as Israel is not publicly understood to be a Jewish state, then the issue of repatriating Lebanese, Syrian, Jordanian, Palestinian refugees to Israel continues. Why is that the case? Repatriating refugees is a major international agenda all over the world. By the way, as well it should be. Whenever is possible, refugees should be restored to the places from which they came. That seems to me to be patently obvious unless there is a reason that that cannot be done. In this particular case, the problem is, is that to repatriate all of those refugees would obviously make it impossible for Israel to maintain the demographic majority of Jews that it needs to be both Jewish and democratic. So therefore, if you can restore all of the refugees back to Israel, you make Israel fundamentally in a position of having to make a choice. Do you want to be Jewish, or do you want to be democratic? Mahmoud Abbas doesn't care which one we choose. Because he knows that the minute we make a choice, it's all over. The vast majority of people sitting right here in this room tonight would certainly not be here if Israel was not a Jewish state, if it was just a Hebrew-speaking, falafel-eating version of Sweden in which the people just didn't look nearly as good. <laughs> Most of you would not be here. But by the same token, if Israel were not a democracy, it would also be much, much, much more difficult for most of you to be in this room. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Mahmoud Abbas and his band of merry men understand full well, you don't have to make Israel's choice. You just have to present Israel with a choice. Because the minute that Israel cannot be both democratic and Jewish, 
the air was taken out of our sails. And the way to make sure that that happens is to make sure that the refugees return to Israel. The way to make sure that that happens is to recognize that even when you get your state in the future, you do not recognize the Jews' right to have a state, and therefore you don't give them any legitimate reason to say those refugees cannot come back here. That's one example. I'll give you another one, much more clear. That other one was a little bit too complicated for you late at night after a video and a speech and a speech. I'll give you one that's much simpler. Mahmoud Abbas said to the New York Times earlier this week, and if it's in the Times, it's obviously completely true. <laughs> he said to the New York Times that Palestine, as he called it, has been occupied by Israel for 63 years. Now, you do not need to have done five points of AP calculus to know that 63 years ago was not 1967. 63 years ago was 1948. So if Palestine has been occupied since 1948, he's already acknowledging that the Green Line and the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, Gaza, call all these various territories what you want to call them, they're not the issue. The issue is Israel's fundamental existence. He has the courage and his conviction, by the way, to say it flat out. We're going to come in a little while to why that's so unbelievably important. But if he says to you this week, not six months ago, not six years ago, not when he was doing his doctorate denying the Holocaust, but this week, you know, I see what he did. But this week, if he said that Israel has occupied Palestine for 63 years, what he is saying to you, by the way, is that Israel was occupying Palestine, don't forget, before there was a Palestinian national movement. There was no Palestinian national movement in 1948. It developed substantially later. So before they knew they wanted a state, before they knew they were a people, we were already occupying them because we existed. We want to take that comment very, very seriously. Now, the Palestinians made a major retraction today, which brings us to the third thing they've said recently. They've retracted. They have actually not retracted. They have clarified, according to the media today. What they have clarified is that when they said that Palestine would be a country without Jews, they didn't mean without Jews, they meant without Israelis. But understand this, for several days, the Palestinians were on record as saying, in a variety of ways, Erika made the point, Abbas made the point, they all said it in slightly different ways, but it was clear, so clear that today they had an issue of this clarification. The Palestinians became the first country on planet Earth, the first proto country on planet Earth, to say unabashedly that there cannot be any Jews in Palestine. Now, by the way, here's the thing. You might say to yourself, well, this is a truly a great loss, because I know so many Jews who are dying to live in the greater Palestinian suburbs of Ramallah and Janine and so on and so forth. This is truly a great setback for many of my friends. Now, I understand that you and I both know there are not a lot of Jews who want to live in Palestine. So why do we care? We care because of this. If you were to ask a Saudi Arabian official, because by the way, Jews cannot live in Saudi Arabia either. But if you were to ask a Saudi Arabian official right now, tonight, can Jews live in Saudi Arabia? you would get a warm, embracing smile, to which the answer would be, of course. Now, if you then said, how many are there, there would be some stammering, but the Saudi Arabians are smart, and they understand that you cannot be seriously taken as a member of the family of nations and say publicly that Jews cannot live in your country. You cannot, in 2011, say that your country is, by definition, Judenrein, and be taken seriously as a member of the family of nations until the Palestinians came very close to doing exactly that. For several days, they were out there saying exactly that. And I want to ask you, how many members of Congress did you hear stand up? I don't care which party. How many members of Congress did you hear stand up and say, that is simply an outrage? Because for the first time since the 1930s, there is a country that claims to be part of the international community relations that unabashedly says, we are going to be free of Jews. The Palestinians also said just today, Unless they run out of things for us to talk about. You know, because I might have had to give exactly the same talk that I gave two nights ago that a keeper heard, so they said that would be a terrible thing. Let us add something for to talk about, right? But they made a point today that even when Palestine, as they call it, is going to be created, those Palestinians living, you've got to hold on to your seats here now, this is an e ride. Those Palestinians living in refugee camps on the West Bank, in the borders of Palestine, as they call it, will not be made Palestinian citizens, because they need to be repatriated back across the border into Israel. In other words, so they don't even want the Palestinian refugees. They're keeping them in the very same refugee status that Syria has kept them, that Jordan has kept them, that Lebanon has kept them. Because the whole thing, of course, you understand, is a charade. The Palestinian refugees all over the north of Israel and to the east would not be refugees 
if Arab countries had done exactly what Israel did when 700,000 Jews were kicked out of Arab lands at about exactly the same time that those Palestinians left Israel for an array of reasons. Israel took every single one of them, as you well know, and made them a citizen. It didn't have housing for them, it didn't have food for them, it didn't have schools for them, it didn't have clothes for them, it didn't have money for them, but they were Jews, and this was a Jewish state, and it made them citizens, and their children and grandchildren both attend and teach at Hebrew University and other places across Israel. The Palestinians understood, though, that they were never going to get that, because the Arab governments understood them to play a very different role. They were pawns. They were going to be kept as pawns for as long as possible and have as many children as possible, according to UNRWA's definition, so that the, even the children and the grandchildren now declared refugees. They were going to be pawns, so for exactly this moment. So the Palestinians could say, no, even the ones that are in the borders of our future country are not going to be made citizens. They have to go back to Israel. Whether it is that Palestine cannot have any Jews in it, whether it is that these refugees are not going to be made citizens, whether it is that Israel's been occupying Palestine since 1948, whatever the case may be, what you understand this is all about, this is not about creating a Palestinian state. If you want to create a Palestinian state, you do not say to the world several days before the vote, no Jews. You keep your mouth shut. If you want to keep the Palestinian state alive in the UN, you do not get in fight by saying that you've occupied us since 1948. If you want to keep a Palestinian state going, and the momentum is clearly in your favor, as we know it is, you stay low, you stay under the radar, you keep your mouth shut, you wait for the UN, and you keep your victory. But that's not the agenda. The agenda is actually to tell the world unabashedly what this is about. And this is about the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. Now, that would be bad enough if it were not for the fact that this is not the first time that forces in the world have announced their intention to, of the Jew, with regard to the Jews and have had the world ignore all the evidence. Hitler wrote Mein Kampf in 1925. He published the second volume in 1926. In other words, far before anybody began to touch a single hair on the head of a single Jew, he had already announced to the world exactly what he intended to do. And the world said it's a crazy guy who wrote a book. It's just a book. This is just an utterance of the Palestinian authority. And what the Nazis did was unbelievably smart. They didn't just round up the Jews one day. First, they got them out of their professions. Then they made them poor by taking away their businesses. Then they put on Jewish stars on their arms. Then they put them into ghettos. They did a whole array of things, all of which were not very nice, but it wasn't genocide. By the time the genocide started, the world actually understood that it was coming. And it wasn't that shocking. And therefore, the world did virtually nothing. Now, if you're going to say to me, what could the world possibly have done? I'll tell you exactly what the world could have done. When the Nazis began to round up priests, the Vatican went ballistic, and those priests were released. When the Nazis, for example, rounded up the entire faculty of the Agalonian University in Krakow, the international academic community also went nuts, and the entire faculty was released. There was but one group, one major group, there were others as well, but there was one major group, of course, for whom nobody had anything to say, nobody spoke up. And that's the analogy that I'm making here tonight. I am not claiming that what is happening at the UN this week is anything remotely like genocide, nor am I suggesting that that's what's going to happen. I'm not saying that. Nor am I comparing Mahmoud Abbas to Hitler. I am not saying that. What I am saying is analogous, and what I am saying is important, what I am saying is disturbing, is the response of the world. Hitler announced what he intended, and the world pretended it didn't hear. They took step after step after step to marginalize and impoverish and to weaken the Jew until the point that they actually went beyond the point of no return, and the world pretended not to understand. That is what is happening here. And we don't even have to talk about the White House. I ask you, who in London, who in Sarkozy's government in Paris, who in Merkel's government in Berlin, and who on Capitol Hill who of the 535 elected officials who make up Congress got up this week to say, if you are going to say that Palestine has been occupied since 1948, then we understand what you're all about, and you have now crossed the line from which you may not come back. If you're going to say, even for 48, 72 hours, I don't care, that Palestine cannot have Jews in it, you have now gone down a dark path which we will simply not countenance. It is not a matter that we're going to simply veto you with the Security Council and vote against you with the General Assembly. We are going to call upon every single one of our allies to understand that that line simply can't be crossed. But the answer, of course, is nobody said that. 
Nobody got up. The silence from Washington and from London and from Paris and from Berlin is simply deafening. It is really unbelievable. And what I would suggest to you is really the most disturbing piece of what you and I are witnessing. It's not that the Palestinians want to do away with the Jewish state. That's kind of old hat. And it's not that the Palestinians have figured out that time is on their side. They've been saying that for a very long time. Yasser Arafat used to say that with great regularity. I want to suggest to you that for me at least, just for me, what is unbelievably sad and disconcerting about this particular week is the silence of the world. As Akiva mentioned, my family and I have lived in Israel for 13 years. It's not a fairly long time, but it's long enough to have lived through the Second Intifada, Second Lebanon War, Gaza, all the way of other issues, all of which were distressing, all of which were sad, all of which were scary. But I will tell you honestly, and this is the first of the two major confessions that I want to make tonight, that nothing that happened in any of those incidences had me as profoundly distraught as what's happening this week. I understand why Palestinians put on bombs and walk into buses. I think it's obscene. I think it's horrific. I think it's immoral at its fundamental basic level. Do I understand why they do it? I understand why they do it. I understand why they do all sorts of things. I think it's horrific. I think it's immoral, as I said before. But can I get in their head? Yes, I can get in their head. Can I get in the head of the silence of Western Europe? Can I get inside the head of Washington and its silence in the face of what is simply in certain ways, only in certain ways, but still in certain ways, a replay of what we saw seven decades ago? I cannot begin to count it. And I will tell you, as an American citizen, as somebody who lived here for a very long time, and is still very proud of that citizenship, I think this is a dark day in the history of the United States. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a liberal issue. It's not a conservative issue. America is not the clarion call for truth and justice that it once was and that it once again must somehow come to be. It is a sad day for America. Now I want to make the second confession that uh, I told you before that I was going to make, and it is this. I found myself in Poland this summer. I didn't find myself there. I got on a plane and went there. <laughs> Uh, it was what Poland is. You don't have to say much more than that. It is a country which in uh, 1941 had 4 million Jews. Today has 10,000. It's a country in which 1941 had Jews in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shtetlach all over the place, and now they're mostly crowded into Warsaw. Not crowded, but find themselves in Warsaw and Krakow, basically only there. And the shtetlach, of course, are Judenheim, just like Palestine of the future. And uh, when each of my kids had gone to Auschwitz as part of the Israeli high school program, because they go for about a week to Poland, they each came back, and you know, there's the ritual. They, um, they come to the airport, they go to the hotel. It's very early, early in the morning, so my wife goes and meets them at the hotel. And um, then they come home. By that time, it's a normal time of the day, and I'm awake to greet them. And uh, we sit by their desks, and they upload all the pictures from their cameras, and they show me this is this, this is this, this is this. And then invariably, it happened with each one of my kids, there is a photograph of them in Auschwitz, each one of them with an Israeli flag. One holding an Israeli flag on a pole, one wrapped in an Israeli flag, one clutching an Israeli flag like in desperation after what he had just seen. And each time I saw that and sat with them at their desks and they were explaining what this picture was, I said to them, you know, this is, a, I want this picture. Send me this one, I want to put it on my screen tip. For me, the image of my kid with that flag was unbelievably compelling and unbelievably moving. And each time, uh, I said to them, send me the picture, and they're all in various places on my computer, my iPad, etc. Et and then about five, six weeks ago, in a horribly dreary, rainy day, which I was glad that it was, because there's something wrong with a nice, sunny day there. Really, it should just never be sunny there. <laughs> Not in totally serious. But thank God, it was raining, and it was disgusting, and we were walking around in mud, and we were uncomfortable, and we were very comfortable compared to people there seven years ago. We got off the bus, and we stood on the very tracks. And it's one thing to know about the tracks, and it's another thing to see the tracks. It's one thing to see pictures of the tracks, and it's one thing to stand on the tracks. It's just different. And we stood on these tracks, and it was about, I don't know, a few hundred yard walk to the very famous gates of Auschwitz. 
And one of the women in our group had done absolutely nothing wrong, but as one might have expected, she had a backpack filled with Israeli flags. And it's raining, but still, she opened up the backpack and she said, who wants a flag? And there were about 40 of us in this group. And everybody's raised down, I want a flag, I want a flag, I want a flag. And I stood in the back of the group and I didn't want a flag. <coughs> and my wife, who thinks of me as a flag holder, <laughs> sort of stared at me, what's the view of the flag thing? Like the woman's giving out flags, hello. Um, I didn't want a flag. And she whispered to me, are you okay? And the answer, of course, was no. And for days afterwards, I tried to articulate, first to myself, but then to her, why I couldn't bear the idea of bringing in a flag. I didn't want anybody else coming. There was anything wrong with it. I didn't want to hold the flag. And there were really two reasons. There were two reasons that I didn't want to bring a flag into the gates of action. First of all, there's something triumphalist about the flag. The flag says, you know what? They came this close to annihilating us, but they didn't. Ha! Huh, we have a country. And that's true, by the way. We have a country which is an unbelievably successful example of what you can build when you believe in something, and when you believe in the goodness of human beings, and when you are focused on the future and not the bitterness of the past. We have a country which, if the Palestinians really wanted a future, they would see stock type to destroy, and they would start to emulate. We have a country which is simply unbelievable. So that's true. In that regard, the flag is completely legitimate. But I couldn't bring in a flag because if you know anything about Polish Jew, there's nothing to be triumphal. It was the crown jewel of world Jewry 70 years ago. And it was erased. It was completely and unalterably erased. It's gone. The various shoals in all the shtetls are either gone or they are museums. There's no reason for them to be shoals because there's no Jews. And the curators of the museums are Christians, because there's no Jews. There's nothing to carry a flag about triumphantly in Poland, it seemed to me. But the other reason that I couldn't bring a flag into Poland, or I couldn't personally carry it that way, was because of this week. We all knew this week was coming. It's been on the books for a very long time. And to stand in that place, which only happened because the world chose to pretend that it was death, because the world chose to pretend that it was blind. Because the world chose to pretend that it didn't understand. To stand in the very place where people simply were vaporized and went up chimneys by the millions. Because the world didn't want to be bothered. And a year in which, once again, the world allows things to be said because it can't be bothered. I found it so unbelievably horrifying so unbelievably devastating that I simply couldn't hold the flag. I couldn't wait to get out of Poland. And I was thrilled that when I got on that plane, it was taking me to Israel and nowhere else. This was not an anti-Zionist movement in any way, believe me, quite the opposite. But it was a recognition that even in the face of having a state, the world still retains the indescribable and explicable ability to turn a deaf ear and a blind eye and to feign ignorance and incomprehension when it knows exactly what's going on. And that is what you and I are going to be witness to unless the vote doesn't happen at the end of this week. We're going to be witness to the world presumably voting to create a state that said it doesn't need Jews, doesn't want Jews, and won't have them. We're going to be witness to the world creating a state that has said that it has been occupied since before it knew it wanted to exist. Because we existed. We're going to be witness to the world creating a state which has said from time immemorial that the Jews have no place in that region of the world. And it's Zionism that's racist. Right? There are Arabs on Israel's Supreme Court. There's one Arab on Israel's Supreme Court. There are Arab ministers in many different governments. There have been Arab MKs in virtually every single government. There are Bedouin women studying to become MDs at Ben Gurion University, and Arab women and men getting PhDs at Hebrew University, and Zionism is racism. And Palestine should be elected and made a state. The travesty and the hypocrisy is simply unbelievable. And that is what you and I are up against. And that is why we're here tonight. We're here tonight because there are a number of organizations 
But in this community especially, it is stand with us that understands that out on the streets, truth must simply be told. That out on the streets, lies must simply be counted. That out on the streets, someone has to give somebody information. Someone has to speak and bespeak a different narrative. That out on the streets, someone needs both the information and the courage of their convictions not to let the media carry but one story. And the organization that does it does that in this city and in cities throughout the country and now, frankly, throughout the world, because it's in Europe as well, is stand with us. That's why we're here tonight. We're here tonight to celebrate and to support an organization that understands fully what needs to be done and, more importantly, knows how to do it and gets it done very effectively. The fact that Stand With Us exists is one of the many reasons that there are, in the face of what's going to be an uphill slog for a very long time, this is not going to be over this week, and it's not going to be over next month. It's not going to be over after that for a very long time. You and I have got to roll up our sleeves and lay up, lace up our boots and get ready for a battle that is going to keep us occupied for a very, very, very long time. And I don't care how much you work out, and I don't care how many statins you take, it is very possible that we may not live to see Israel have this conflict fully resolved. But that's not the point. The point is that we're going to be judged not by whether or not we got this conflict resolved, but whether or not we defended truth and justice while it was being waged. So one of the reasons that we have, I think, great cause for optimism is the fact that you are here and that you are here in the support of an organization that exists and that is so effective. There's another reason that there is to be tremendously optimistic, even in the face of the uphill slog, even in the face of the tremendous amount of work that we have to do, even in the face of the devastatingly sad news that we are likely to see in the paper this week, next week, and beyond. Turkey is saber-rattling, Egypt is rethinking the treaty, Iran is still doing its thing, the world doesn't care about any of this, by the way. Imagine that there was a protest, I don't know, where, somewhere in Israel, about the upcoming vote, and three Palestinians got shot by Israeli forces. Can you imagine the front pages? And note what's happening in Syria. They get mowed down by the dozens every week, Hundreds and probably thousands at this point. There's a small little article on front page of the New York Times today. The State Department is quietly preparing for a post Assad regime. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> the duplicity and the hypocrisy is unbelievable. So, how do you maintain a certain sense of optimism in that? As I said, first of all, that you're here and that Stand With Us is here and that we're here together to make sure that we can support each other. But I also want to tell you a brief story. A story about a guy who Daven in my shul from the time that he created the shul in 1948 until the time that he passed away earlier this year. He was a survivor of that same rainy, gray, horrible place that I mentioned earlier. And with a few other survivors of that same horrific place, they made their way out and eventually to the land of Israel, to a small little abandoned building in Jerusalem, and built a tiny little shul about a third of the size of this room, which holds twice as many people as this room, and got him there three times a day, every day of his life, until he no longer was here. His name was Siggy. And I remember him, especially this time of the year, because with the holidays coming up, Yisker is also, as you know, around the corner. And the following is a story about Yisker. My grandfather was a very well-known rabbi of a very large congregation in Long Island in New York for many, many years. And in his congregation, although there was a tradition in many Jewish communities that if you don't have to say Yisker, you walk out, my grandfather had a tradition, you stayed in and you say Yisker for a, 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 a person lost in the Holocaust who had nobody to say Yisker for them, or an Israeli soldier. His point was everybody in the world has somebody they can say Yisker for, nobody goes out. I think he just didn't want to believe in the shul, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> My father, who had grown up in my grandfather's shul, had the same rule for his children. And in my father's case, it was clearly because he was afraid that his children were not going to come back in. And he was 100% correct. More with my younger brother than with me, uh, but I would have taken my sweet time making my way back also. So I grew up, he stayed in for your spirit no matter what. But in my shul, where I davened in Jerusalem, where Siggy davens and a few other people, to uh, put it mildly, daven, everybody goes out for your spirit. I can either stay in, in sort of obey, you know, sort of respecting my father's and grandfather's tradition, and then explain to everybody, no, 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 everything's okay, everything's fine, it's just that and the whole story. Or I can suddenly walk out. It takes exactly this year as three minutes. You walk out, you say hello to people, you walk back in, it's over. And I decided earlier on that I'm going to walk out. 
It's the middle of the intifada. Life is not good. Life is scary. Life is frustrating. Life is infuriating, and we get to some holiday, I forget which one it was already, and it's time for this. I'm completely absent-minded, feeling very sorry for myself that I had moved my family from a tree-lined street in Los Angeles, where really the most exciting thing that ever happened was when the gardener got a new weed whacker, to a place where literally my city was blowing up by the day, and there were people literally trying to kill my children on the way to school. I absently minded of walking out for Yisker, and Siggy, who always sat by the door back then, grabbed my arm, but really grabbed my arm. And he said, you're going out for Yisker? And I said, Dad? No. And I said, yeah, I'm going out for Yisker. And his eyes filled with tears. And still grabbing my arm with a strength that was somewhat surprising for a gentleman of his age, he said to me in that choked up voice that we all understand, he said, when we first got here, there was nobody in this shul who could go out for Yisker. Mm -hmm. Then he said to me, And then there were more wars, and more boys fell, and still nobody could go out for Yisker. The Akshav, he said, now, Look outside. Everybody's outside Friska. Hamdina Hazot Mis. This country is a miracle. And I was unbelievably humbled by that. And I think of him every time I say this. And I think of him every time I open the paper and I say to myself, it can't get worse. And then I think of his life and I remember it can get a lot worse. And it won't get that good. It's not going to get anywhere close to that. Because he's right. Hamdina hazot miss. This country is...